we have Mark Cheshire, Global Director, Product Management, Application Services, Red Hat. And he would be sharing a very interesting topic, which will also be a good con conclusion of this connected finance stack about when to manage your microservices as a mesh or an API. So welcome, Mark. Great. Thanks very much for being here. Great. So over to you. Please take the stage. Great. So f first of all, um, just uh, give you a context set for where I am since we're coming from all over the world to this virtual conference um, uh, in my uh, 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 vacation home. So it's a beautiful beach resort just outside Barcelona in Spain. So not a bad setting to be able to do a conference presentation like this. <laughs> anyway, really cool. yeah. <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, let me uh, get my screen shared. So this topic is, as Tira says, all about when to manage microservices. When should you use a service mesh or when should you manage them as if they're APIs? And this, this is um, a, an introductory topic. It's quite a technical topic. Um, so one of the things to, since this is in the finance track, it's to highlight that uh, at Red Hat, we've got numerous uh, banking and financial services customers that are moving very quickly to, uh, to increase the agility of their IT operations by transitioning to uh, Kubernetes container platform. Uh, and in Red Hat's case, that's OpenShift. So this is a very important point for financial services customers as they're making these transitions to more cloud native environments and start rolling out microservice architecture, how to think about the management aspects of that. And this session will be followed later on at the top of the hour by a, a natural workshop to get some hands-on experience from another Red Hat colleague. So my name is Mark Cheshire, and let's walk through this over the next 20 minutes. First of all, to give some context on what the two types of different management approaches are, the, the one that people are more comfortable and familiar with is the traditional API management. API management has been around now for uh, 15 to 20 years as a, as a market. And it's grown tremendously quickly because as web APIs scaled out and people saw the power of web APIs, web APIs were not only used to connect applications over the public internet, they're also being used to connect applications within an enterprise boundary. And so we've seen tremendous growth of API management solutions to manage these environments. At its core is the API gateway and it's the gateway that's the, the key control point for API traffic. The APIs themselves become a, a, a contact point for your business, how you expose either data from your business or logic from your business, essentially a digital access point. The purpose of API management, the things you care about, are making sure that the connections between clients and the APIs themselves are very secure you know who's accessing which resources. You have s sophisticated processes for onboarding developers. Uh, um, uh, an important term that has come up in this area is developer experience. The better the developer experience, the more likely you'll, you will be to see adoption of your APIs. And analytics to be able to understand exactly who is accessing which resources on, on your APIs. So all of these things are important factors of an API management solution. And the, the architectural pattern that you, you can think that this applies is a north-south model uh, as opposed to an east-west model for controlling access. So this is where API gateways fit in and it brings together all traditional API management capabilities. Let's look at an example of this on the next page. So here you can see that um, on the bottom row are a number of the different API services that have been developed within this e-commerce company. So uh, there's uh, 
uh, a, a widget uh, to be able to expose things on an e-commerce shopping page. There's a customer database with an API to that information. There's the finance area of their APIs for handling billing. There's a tracking API for customers to see the state uh, of, of delivery of their goods and then a logistics API for transport partners to be able to connect and ensure that they get the products to the right customer. On top of that, at the very top row, we have all of the API consumers, so it's different forms. It can be uh, a partner, uh, so an affiliate with a web store that's sending links back to the e-commerce website. There's the website itself, mobile applications for browsing through the shopping site and partner applications such as a shipping company. Now, what we're showing here is the reality that very often you have a lot of APIs that are developed, but you, want to you don't want to expose all of that granular detail to the consumers of your APIs. You want to simplify that and package it into uh, simpler blocks. And that's where we have the term API products. That essentially is a facade for the internally developed APIs and groups them into products that make more sense for a consumer. So in this case, we've taken five different APIs that have been implemented and we've distilled that down to three products that we want to offer and that address the needs of different groups of consumers. You see the, the widget product on the left-hand side, which addresses affiliates. Then there's the internet product, so to speak, which provides a way for websites and mobile clients to be able to get access to all the services they need, whether it's the widget, customers, finance, or tracking information. And then there's the shipping product, which is clearly useful for any shipping partners. So that's a way of how we implement north-south traffic management with an API gateway. Let's now see how things look when uh, implementing a microservice mesh. So with microservices, there's a lot of similarities because API is essentially an integration pattern, interaction pattern between microservices. So there's a lot of similarities in uh, APIs that you saw previously. One of the th key differences is that just the sheer scale of things. When you're talking about APIs that you expose publicly, they typically are in the order of tens of APIs in magnitude. When it comes to microservices, a company is likely to have many thousands of APIs. So you need a very different approach to manage that huge uh, number. One, one of the approaches is separating the control plane and the data plane to ensure better scalability. And the other important consideration is to automate every aspect of your operation. So every time you deploy a new API, make sure that everything's fully automated because you cannot manage things at this scale manually clicking through a UI to publish an API. Some of the important capabilities when it comes to service mesh management are distributed tracing. You need to be able to understand what are the uh, dependencies between all of these thousands of APIs when they're executing a transaction, mutual TLS to ensure secure communication between any of the two, uh, any two microservices, and uh, con access control capabilities like allow lists and de deny lists. Bottom line, this is an east-west architectural pattern, and it's typically implemented in the form of a service mesh. Um, so. Uh, Istio is the most well-known service mesh, and uh, Red Hat works closely with the uh, Istio uh, open source community and uh, uses that as the basis for Red Hat's uh, uh, open service mesh uh, product. So these are the two aspects of uh, managing services, whether they're APIs or microservices. Let's have a look now at a real life uh, example, and it should be straightforward then to uh, apply these considerations and requirements and see which is the right fit. So taking a typical example here, um, consumers who are accessing the APIs of a large enterprise, 
um, you see that there's the API product, which provides that facade for the APIs that consumers care about. And then within the Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, the, the base for all of the microservices in the platform, uh, there's a group of different groupings of microservices. Some of them directly provide a service for the API product and others provide uh, cross-dependent services within the mesh itself. So this is the area where we're looking to manage everything. And if you think about it, uh, apply the uh, rule north-south management, east-west management, it looks very clear. Uh, you apply north-south management at that external boundary uh, where you have external facing APIs. And for east-west management, you apply it to basically everything else within the cluster itself. So done deal, simple, no? Well, this is what the way it would look when you roll all, all of that out, but it's not quite so easy. So there's some other important considerations. And in, in order to better understand that, let's have a look at uh, some, some other boundaries that you may want to care about. So when you look inside the cluster and all of the different services that are running, what you will often notice is that there's different domains that are, uh, that are in, inside the cluster. And each of these domains probably you want to treat their interfaces to other domains in the same way as you do the interface at the enterprise boundary. So that's an important takeaway to look in, whenever you have a large environment, have a look at what the domain boundaries are within your cluster, and then think about applying API management in uh, control to those domain boundaries. That will help you get more control and ensure better management of, the, of who's accessing which resources when, the, when traffic goes across domain. Within a single domain boundary, there you typically don't need to, uh, you, you, it's fine to continue using service mesh management because within a domain boundary, you've effectively got a, a two pizza type uh, developer team there's, there's enough developers to sit around a table and share two pizzas. And with, with a group like that, they, you typically don't need such formal documentation and um, the, the teams can work together directly. Typically, it's one microservice consuming one other microservice. There's not many, one too many relationships. Expanding that notion and going into more detail about what are the differences between inter and intra-domain traffic. The key thing is that for intra-domain, inter-domain traffic on the left-hand side, it's much more of a hierarchical relationship between producers and consumers. So uh, there's often multiple consumers of one API or one service rather than just a single one. On the right-hand side for intra-domain traffic, which you typically see in a microservice mesh, is more of a connected graph of services. And the, um, it's very often a one-to-one -one relationship that one microservice consumes just one other microservice. In one way, this is the typical decomposition of a monolithic application, and you've just broken uh, function calls down into network calls. and. Uh, that's, that's basically what you've done with a microservice uh, at, within a domain area. Other things to note are that with, with uh, inter-domain traffic, it's very important to, when you have multiple consumers, to differentiate the roles of those different consumers. Um, we had the example earlier with, uh, we, we had the example earlier with the uh, external partners, the shipping company, company versus the affiliate versus the, uh, the applications, the website and the mobile app of the e-commerce company. So those are different user roles and you need to differentiate access rules for those different consumer groups and take that into account when you do authentication and authorization. The contracts become more formalized for inter-domain traffic because you, uh, you, you, want, you want to make sure that the consumer 
knows uh, exactly what the API interface is. They they know that when they start using an, uh, a certain version of an API, that they'll be able to continue using that version of the API and there won't be breaking changes that get introduced. And the experience for developers should be one of help guiding developers to find the right APIs and that's often accomplished with a developer portal and good interactive documentation. On the right-hand side for microservices, I said earlier, consumers are usually uh, part of the same team, so they're, they're sitting at the same table sharing those same two pizzas. And you don't need to be so strict about authorization rules. Uh, the main thing is that you have good auth authentication in place but you trust people that you share a pizza with that they're not going to eat too much of the pizza, otherwise you're in problem. And the same applies to, uh, you trust them not to consume too much of the microservice that's within the same domain area. Contracts in that way are very implicit, uh, like uh, if, if, you, if you break my shit, I'm going to come and get you at lunchtime. So a lot more implicit, the contracts. And internal documentation, you, you typically don't see formal uh, interactive documentation on the developer portal. More often, it's documentation that's embedded within the Git repo and uh, or self-documented within the code itself. So these are differences between inter and intra-domain traffic. And that brings us then to the key reasons that service mesh and API management are very different and why most customers will want to use both of them side by side. API management is all about managing a relationship between APIs and all of the different servers, uh, consumers of those APIs. So it's, it's very much the aspects of managing the relationship. Service mesh, on the other hand, is very much more of how do I control traffic that's going across this mesh of thousands of microservices and the key concerns here are all about how do you handle traffic control, security, resilience with things like uh, uh, circuit breaking to make sure that uh, uh, traffic can flow through the network and observability. So those are the key things that uh, key requirements from the service mesh angle. Let's have a look how this comes together in Red Hat. So within Red Hat, we have a uh, um, application architecture approach. Uh, you have a mix of traditional architecture on the left-hand side, microservice on the right-hand side. All of this may well be uh, running on top of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, such as OpenShift. And when it comes to microservice, very clearly it's advantageous to use service mesh to ensure that everything's uh, connecting smoothly and efficiently. But then on top of that, you can apply API management. And the API management can bridge both of these worlds. And uh, you do not need to use API management for every microservice. Uh, it's, uh, you can apply it selectively. And I'll come on to that soon in a, in a real example. The other aspect to think of on this uh, architectural model is that there are very different stakeholders for each of these areas. The Kubernetes cluster will often be managed by the infrastructure owner. App, app developers will care about writing the, uh, coding the apps, whether it's traditional architecture or microservices. The service mesh will be uh, generally rolled out and managed by the DevOps team. And uh, the API management is very often the focus of the service owner or the API owner. They want to decide who has access to the resources that they're exposing. So let's have a look at a quick integrated use case here. I'll, I'll whiz through, through this very fast. So we've got a, um, a, a service here. It's a product API. There are the blue boxes and new microservices and the, the dark brown or red box. That's a legacy service. And we're looking to manage this. Um, we're going to take advantage of integration that's provided between API management and service mesh. That's something that's available in Red Hat solutions. Uh, within the API management product, you can add on a service mesh option. And then when you look at the environment, you uh, each of the hexagonal uh, 
blue uh, uh, blue hexagons, they are envoy sidecars, so they're traffic control points right across the service mesh, and it's a sidecar for every single microservice that's deployed. And with the integration, you can determine exactly where you want to apply API management policies. So in this case, we're only applying the API management policy for the, the product service itself. That's the external boundary. And for all of the other ones, we leave those to be handled by the service mesh. And by having that mix of service management and API management gives you great flexibility. You can start with API management and then extend to with service mesh capabilities, or you can start with service mesh and then later add on API management capabilities. And you minimize any duplication and you the, the effort that you put in to implement policies, you can leverage across both areas. So with that, just a final reminder, API management is all about the relationship aspect and service mesh is all about advanced traffic control and observability. With that, I'll be able to take any questions. And one reminder, just starting at the top of the hour, is uh, the workshop. And you'll see some of this in uh, action, uh, live coding with Satya Chaitani. So please take a look at that. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mark, for such an insightful session. And personally, I really like these technical sessions because it kind of brings you into deep dive and also looking forward to the workshop after the break which we have uh, and going through the chat section so we do not have any questions as of now but before we wrap up the session if you can also elaborate what uh, would be the part of the workshop which will be happening after the break just for the audience reference because certainly i believe there are a lot many people interested for that yeah, so, so what Satya will be digging into a bit more details of the, the this uh, how to go about integrating service mesh and API management. So he'll be deploying uh, a live uh, microservice mesh, uh, and he'll be deploying API, API management connecting the two and showing how they work side by side. So a perfect thing for a company looking to build up a, a strong financial application on a Kubernetes cluster and how to manage them effectively. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. So